Do you know how a pearl is made? Do you know that an oyster that has not been wounded in any way would never produce pearls? I was recently reminded that pearls are a product of pain. When a foreign or unwanted substance enters into the oyster, such as a parasite or a grain of sand, the oyster responds by producing a protective layer called nacre. Over two years, thousands of these fine protective layers combine, made of organic and inorganic substance, creating the beautiful and shiny translucent ball that we know as a pearl. The pearl is lighter and stronger than concrete. An oyster that hasn't been wounded by a grain of sand or a foreign entity cannot produce this brilliance. Beautiful pearls form from an unwanted irritant. Life, I think, has a way of bringing foreign and unwanted irritants into our lives, too. And some of these irritants are mild and mundane, but some of these irritants are life-altering. We might even say life-shattering. They can lead us down hard paths, leaving us hurting, confused, grief-stricken, or uncertain, with lots of unanswered questions. To encourage us in these times of distress, for being human, we know we will have them, we can, of course, turn to the Psalms and to the Scriptures which help us put words to our life experiences when no words come easily to us. And they certainly don't come naturally on their own. As Liz mentioned, today's psalm is a psalm of lament. And one-third of the 150 psalms in the Psalter are psalms of lament. So we should not be surprised when events in our own lives bring us to this painful place of disorientation where this irritant has disrupted our status quo. When life doesn't make any sense, when grief, uncertainty, fear, worry, those things lead us to a place of lament as well. But even when we know to expect this suffering, when that gut punch comes, the diagnosis, the sudden death of a loved one after a long illness, perhaps, or right away. When our hopes and dreams for ourselves or our loved ones don't come to fruition as we had hoped and expected. When we experience a crisis of faith, which some have called the dark night of the soul. When loneliness is our daily companion, when we struggle to find goodness in the world. We wonder, why? Why is this happening? Why am I struggling? What did I do to deserve this pain? Why me? Why my child? Why my parent? Why my fill in the blank? Perhaps like the psalmist, we say, why do bad things happen to good people? And why do the wicked prosper. While we didn't read the entirety of Psalm 73 today, the movement from beginning to end in this psalm is a status of disorientation that returns to a place of orientation. Orientation around who God is and God's goodness in the midst of the disorientation. It's an honest confession of a man named Asaph, a chief musician who had been appointed by King David, who wrote this psalm and is credited with writing a few others as well. He cries out to God, bringing the inequities of life and his honest doubts and questions before God, and points out that his misery, and he takes this misery to God into prayer. He doesn't pretend everything is okay but honestly describes in his own confusion with life and its search for purpose and meaning, 
he notices and recognizes, as many of us do, that life is full of contradictions and paradoxes and tension. And his experience reminds us also of the story of Job, who also struggled with understanding who God was in the midst of his suffering. Where was God in his involvement and presence in real life as well? Confusion often comes to us when our hearts and minds believe and long to believe in a loving and just God. But when we look around our world and see so much pain and suffering, or when we ourselves, or when our family members, those that we love, experience life-altering irritants, then we may wonder, are we alone? Is God with us? This is a psalm that deals with these complex matters and questions of life as they are, not as they pretend to be. The writer of the psalm knew hardship and yet was able to proclaim in verse 26, God is the strength of my heart. God is the strength of my heart. This literally means that God's the rock, the foundation, the core of our lives. The psalmist affirms courage to trust in God in the middle of these challenges and problems despite the questions that he has and the anger and doubt that he expresses. We aren't told exactly what he experienced, but we are told that when he went to the place of worship, that is when his heart and his perspective was changed. And isn't that why we come to worship too? We long for our hearts and our perspectives on the challenges of life to be changed. And so we gather here today to worship the God who calls us beloved, the incarnational Christ who is here with us. Think for a moment when you have been in an experience where your mind or body has just had enough. Just scan your life for a moment. When you have felt that you couldn't bear the struggle any longer, when you had lost someone dear to you, and in those moments of despair, where do you find the strength that carries you through those moments? What is, that, what is it that mysteriously sustains us in the midst of our challenging and heartbreaking circumstances? Our faith tradition teaches us the importance of bringing our whole selves, our spiritual life, our emotional life, our physical being to God because God wants to be with us in the journey we face ahead. And like Asaf, we have come today to worship this God. And that is why as a community of faith, we gather twice a year during a moment of worship for a service of healing and wholeness. Because the life-altering irritants and the pain that comes into our lives is a part of God's wholeness. Hopes and dreams that will, be not, will not be the systemic, systemic sins we see and feel hopeless to change, the breakdown of our bodies that don't do what they once did, and even the suffering of loss that is named and easy to name in grief or sometimes is less tangible to name. In these moments, God meets us where we are and something beautiful and strong is being created, even when we can't see it just like the pearl in the oyster. And as people of faith, we recognize that every single season of life brings its challenges and joys and our hopes and concerns. And sometimes we just need to stop long enough to be reminded of the one in whom we have hope, the one we call creator and redeemer and sustainer of all things, the one who understands our pain and is with us in it.
the one who says, be still and know that I am God. Earlier this year, I had an opportunity to take a pilgrimage to Israel. And on that pilgrimage, we found ourselves in the city of Magdala in a beautiful church that had been built there. And in the lower level of this church is a chapel. And our group was gathered for a healing and wholeness service. I don't remember what was said. I don't remember what hymns we sang. But I remember that God met me in my time of need, in a time where I couldn't even articulate or name what I was feeling, but knew I needed to be held. And in that moment, the tears came for myself and all of my fellow pilgrimages, pilgrims. Those tears that I didn't even know I needed were a part of God's healing and wholeness in my life. Sometimes we run from tears, but this time, Tears were healing. I don't know where you are today on your life's journey with God. If God feels absent to you today, out of reach, or if slowly or suddenly over time you found yourself daring to come to worship today, even though pieces of faith don't fit back together the way you had hoped. I don't know if you're experiencing in this moment life-altering irritants, small ones that are mundane or large ones that are life-altering. Whatever your circumstance may be, know that God longs to meet you too here in this time and in this place. And if things are going well for you in your life and in your life of faith and you are standing firm in the strength of the Lord. Know that in this time and in this place, God longs to meet you too, where you are. Because it's when we stop long enough to experience God's love and outpouring of grace, we begin the journey of healing and wholeness. The 16th century mystic, St. John of the Cross, has said that silence is God's first language. How often in our busy and hectic lives do you find time for silence? The late Trappist monk, Thomas Keating, commented on this insight of silence being God's first language and expanded upon it to say, everything else is a poor translation. In order to understand this language, he says, we must learn to be silent, to rest in God. And so that is what we will do today as a part of our healing and wholeness service. You will be invited to rest in God, the one who calls you beloved. Whether your irritant in life is uprooting you completely or whether it's just small and mundane but you know it's there. Whatever your life circumstance, trust that the Lord will meet you today. And know that you are not alone. And like the psalmist Asaph, God is the strength of your heart. So I invite you now, if you're comfortable to do so, to close your eyes, to get settled into your seat, and to take time set apart for your soul care this morning. This time, this silence is set apart for you and for God. I invite you to enter this sacred silence with an open heart, to sit prayerfully with whatever emerges for you in this time, trusting in the presence of the Holy Spirit to hold you and to guide you and to being open to how this moment is a part of God's healing and return to wholeness for you. Following this time of silence, we will sing together, Spirit of the Living God, 